Good evening and welcome to Ecourse Community Bible Church Adult Bible Study. Every Wednesday night at 6.30, we try to come into your homes with YouTube and Facebook at 6.30. Tonight, we should be on time. If we're ever a little tardy, then just wait and try a little bit later. But uh, today we're going to be in the book of Revelation and pick up where we left off last time. So get your Bibles out, please. And uh, open up to the book of Revelation, chapter 1 and verse 5. So um, while you're doing that, uh, I'd like to open us in a word of prayer. Let us bow our heads and our hearts before our Lord. Gracious Father, thank you. <clears throat> for the privilege to uh, hear your voice. And Father, to be taught by the Holy Spirit. And so I just pray that, uh, uh, Lord, you might forgive me of any of my sins and shortcomings and fill me with your Holy Spirit. And we pray that as your word goes forward, that you might be able to minister to the hearts of anyone who tunes in. Bless your word now as it goes forward. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen. All right, uh, let's get right into it. Uh, the revelation of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Excuse me. And verse five, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. We left off last time with this part um, from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, who is the first begotten of the dead. And we said last time that Jesus Christ, at his incarnation, took on human flesh. And the Bible in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 says that he became the last Adam. The first Adam, flesh and blood, and all men die in Adam. So the last Adam, uh, now uh, a glorified body, but he also took on flesh and blood, yet without sin. And so it says here that uh, he is the first begotten from the dead. That meant that his body died at the cross and he rose from the dead and he ascended into heaven. And he took a glorified body with him. And so... Uh, we're gonna talk about the fact of his incarnation, that he took on flesh. We're gonna talk about that he was the first to rise from the dead in a glorified body, the first man. We said last time that some might say, well, Enoch, didn't he take his body to heaven? And the Bible tells us that Enoch uh, was there and then all of a sudden he wasn't, God, because God took him. God had to place his body someplace and you know why? Because the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, 50, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God because the sin hadn't been paid for and it, it must be changed. Uh, Elijah went up to heaven in a chariot, but God had to place his body someplace because flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God and he was not glorified. Moses' body was taken and it was placed some place, the last uh, chapter of Deuteronomy. And so God has a future purpose for Elijah and for Moses. We read this in the last chapter, chapter four, in the book of Malachi, the last two verses, four through six. And so when it says here, the firstborn of the church, uh, we're speaking about how that Jesus Christ, uh, who started the church at Pentecost, uh, the Bible says in the book of uh, uh, Acts chapter 2, that uh, the Holy Spirit came and filled the 120 in the upper room. And that was the beginning of the church. And what makes a, a person a Christian? Certainly because Christ died on the cross, that he was buried and that he rose again. Paul the Apostle says in 1 Corinthians 15, three through four, but I delivered unto you that which I first received, how that Christ died on the cross for our sins. It says, according to the scriptures, and he was buried and he rose again from the dead according 
to the scriptures. That is the core of the gospel. And so uh, <clears throat> for believers now, uh, the only person who has been raised from the dead is Jesus Christ. And uh, he started the church in Acts chapter 2. And so the Bible tells us that uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 13, that uh, the Bible says uh, that um, the Holy Spirit uh, baptizes us into the body of Christ. So if you're, um, for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jew or Gentile, bond or free, we've all been made to drink into one spirit. So the Bible tells us that the church is a unique and uh, distinct entity from Old Testament Israel. And um, uh, we also know that, um, I'm going to use the verse uh, Galatians uh, 3 and 28, there is neither Jew nor Gentile in Christ. Neither Jew nor Gentile. What does that mean? That means that the church is distinct. And that's what we're dealing with here at the rapture. It's the rapture of the church. We're going to talk about a couple of verses. Um, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 16 through 17 tells us, The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God. And what does it say? The dead, what? In Christ shall be raised first. The dead in Christ. Remember what we said, Galatians 3.28, there's neither Jew nor Gentile, but all are one in Christ. So what about the Jew? God is not finished with the, the Jewish family. Uh, the Old Testament was written about the Jewish family. And um, he has not done with the Jewish family. Romans chapter 11, verse 26 tells us that... Uh, all of Israel will be saved in one day. Now, when is that day? That day is going to be when Christ comes back at his second coming. And I'm going to refer to the chart here. Uh, we have a chart here of the seven-year tribulation period that the Bible teaches in the book of Revelation, also in the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 9 and verse 27 tells us it's going to be seven years. Okay? The great tribulation, however, or tribulation of the great, is the last three and a half years. We call it Tribulation of the Great. You'll notice that the seven-year tribulation between these two arrows are uh, shown divided in the middle, three and a half years, and Tribulation of the Great, three and a half years. So uh, <clears throat> during this period of time, it's also called uh, Daniel's 70th week. I should probably write that in here. I guess I didn't write that in here. And that's important. Okay, Daniel's 70th week. All right, and that's, the word is hepta in the uh, uh, Septuagint, and that word means seven. It's uh, a seven-year period, and, in, and, and, and the reason that we divide this in the middle, three and a half years, and then Tribulation the Great, is because in Daniel chapter 9 and verse 27, the Bible tells us that this uh, prince, which is the Antichrist, the man of lawlessness, is going, and, and the first beast, there are plenty of names for the Antichrist, and uh, he's the prince. Well, remember what the Bible calls uh, Satan, the prince of the power of the air. This Antichrist is called the prince in uh, Daniel chapter 9 and 27. And uh, he says he's going to make a covenant with Israel. All right, so we've got here uh, the rapture of the church. The church is gone, and that's what we're going to be explaining here. Christ is rapturing his church. Okay, there's a distinction between Jews and Christians, and we're going to develop this a little bit. The rapture of the church, and then at this point right here, the Antichrist is revealed. It says the rider on the uh, white horse. He's coming in bringing peace. But it's a false peace. 
And at this time, he's going to uh, make a peace treaty with the Jews, and uh, they're going to be able to rebuild their temple. And in the middle of the temple, in the middle of the uh, tribulation, Daniel chapter 9, 27 says he's going to uh, break his uh, covenant with Israel in the middle. And uh, at that time, he, the uh, abomination of desolation is going to take place where Antichrist is going to go into the temple. There is no temple in Jerusalem today. On the place where the old temple mount, uh, they have uh, a, a Muslim temple. And uh, presently, that's right where the temple is. So something will have to be done in order for uh, the temple to be rebuilt because the temple must be rebuilt on that spot. And so Antichrist will come in riding on a white horse, meaning he'll be bringing peace and he'll make a covenant with Israel for seven years and they'll be able to rebuild their temple, which is very important because when you get to the middle of the tribulation period, the abomination of desolation takes place. And what is that? That is when the Antichrist, he'll either offer a uh, pig, which is an unclean animal, in the presence where there was uh, uh, the Shekinah glory of God, and that's an abomination. Uh, or he himself will set up his throne there, and he will claim that he is God, the God of the people, and demand to be worshipped. And that will ha be happen in the middle of the tribulation period. All right, so <clears throat> this is all about Israel, isn't it? This doesn't have anything to do with uh, the church. Uh, that's why we're discussing this and taking some time to explain it. As we look in the book of Revelation, we see that Christ is the first fruits here. And uh, <clears throat> that he has been raised from the dead and the first fruits of them who are asleep. Um, <clears throat> then we go on and we see in 1 Corinthians 15, 23, a couple verses later, it says, but every man in his order, Christ in the Christ, the first fruits. And afterwards, those who are what? Those who are Christ's. Who is he dealing with here? He is dealing with the church, the true church. We know that uh, during this period of time uh, that uh, the Bible predicts in uh, Revelation 2 and 3 about the final state of the church is the apostate church is the church at Laodicea. It will be pre predominant in the days in the last days. We believe that it is predominant today. It's lukewarm. When uh, go to Revelation 3, 14 and through uh, 20, 21, and it says that uh, uh, when they're with the world, they'll act like the world. When they're with uh, Christians, they'll act like Christians. They'll walk right down the middle and God says he'll spew them out of his mouth. But right there before the church at Laodicea is the church of Philadelphia. And the church of Philadelphia is the word church. The church at Philadelphia, it says, you kept the word of my patience. In uh, Revelation chapter uh, 3, uh, beginning at uh, 6 or 7 and going until uh, verse 10, we see that uh, the Philadelphian church is the church that also is the church of the open door. It's an evangelistic church. They have a passion for evangelizing. It says they have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Therefore, this church in Revelation 3.10 says this, and this is a rapture verse. It says that uh, uh, <clears throat> because you have kept the word of my patience, I will keep you from the hour of trial and it uses the word temptation in the King James Version, but temptation and trial is the same Greek word. So whatever, a temptation is trial, as well as a, a, a trial being a temptation. It says, I will keep you from the hour of trial, from the time of trial that will come upon the whole world. To do what? To try the world, to try the whole earth. To try whom? The earth dwellers. It's not there to uh, try the, uh, the church. Why? And the Bible says in Revelation, I'm sorry, in Romans chapter 8 and 1, it says there is therefore no condemnation. There is no wrath 
to be poured upon God's saints, his Christians. It says there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ, those who are the called according to his purpose. So the church will not experience the wrath of God. We will be delivered from the wrath which is to come. And so uh, when the rapture takes place, it is for the church. And so we see this arrow going up. We see down here, this arrow coming down, and uh, this is the return of Christ to the earth. And so there are uh, many, maybe more than 50% of the church that believe in this scenario here, that Christ is coming uh, to the earth to receive uh, Christians at this moment, okay? If that's the case, 50% of the church, a little more than 50% of the church believe that. They don't believe in a pre-trib rapture, and that's why we're spending some time to see what does the Bible say. Let you make up your minds and let the Holy Spirit lead you. I want the Holy Spirit to lead me. But these are the verses that uh, we're sharing. Uh, if this is, if there is no pre-trib rapture, and if this is uh, when Christ is coming, the second coming for his church, then this is what it's going to look like, this little arrow up here. This is the post-trib rapture for Christians. They say that Christ will then be caught up. There'll be a little loop while he's in the air and he'll bring them right back. The Bible doesn't say that. There's nowhere in the Bible that it says that. And does that make any sense? And I'll repeat 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 18. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ shall be raised first, that is, my father, uh, 1973, was put in the grave, and, and uh, your family members, if they've died in Christ. The Bible says those in Christ shall be raised first, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with the Lord. Where? In the air. For how long? Forever. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Then the Bible says comfort one another with these words. Okay, so <clears throat> we're talking today uh, about a pre-trib rapture. We're talking, why then does Christ come back uh, to the earth? And for whom? When Christ comes back to the earth, if the, if the Christians have been raptured, uh, we'll look at, uh, we're, we're going to look at um, what are some of the things that are gonna, gonna be taking place. But here, uh, Christ is coming back for the Jews. And it uh, says in uh, uh, Revelation chapter 20 that the Jews will, he will then set up his millennial kingdom, Revelation 20 and verses four through nine. And the Jews will live there in their physical bodies for a thousand years, in their physical bodies. Uh, where would the Christians be? We have glorified bodies. Philippians chapter three, 20 and 21, tells us that our citizenship is in heaven not on earth our citizenship is in heaven from whence we look for the savior the lord jesus christ who shall change our mortal bodies he's coming when he comes at the rapture he comes to take us to take us up why is it important to understand that the bodies are being changed, glorified? Why is that important? Because the Bible says the dead, what, what use would it be for him to be raising dead bodies out of the ground and take those to heaven if they're not going to be uh, changed? In the twinkling of an eye, in a moment at the last trump, 1 Corinthians 15, 52, 51, 52, and 53. What would be the, what would be the purpose of raising the dead bodies if he's not going to glorify those saints? that have died, what? In Christ. And we'll keep repeating this because there are two entities in the Bible that are we're dealing with, with regards to our uh, tribulation period here. That's the Jews and that's the Christians. And what did we say, <clears throat> the distinction here, Galatians 3.28, there's neither Jew nor Gentile, but are one in Christ. Uh, the church, you don't say, oh, well, this person is a Jewish, or you don't even say this person's a Jewish Christian. A person might be a Jewish Christian, but he is a Christian. And a person might be a Gentile, but it it's, doesn't matter. He is a Christian. So neither Jew nor Gentile, all are one in Christ. 
and that God is going to raise the Jews at the end of the tribulation period. Once again, where does it say that? In uh, Romans chapter 11, 26, in one day, the Jews. Now the Jews here, uh, actually, it doesn't say that they're going to be raised. Uh, it's going to say that uh, they are going to inherit this, they're going to, in, uh, in their flesh bodies, uh, not, not, it's, their, their bodies will not be um, regenerated. Uh, uh, Christians, what are we going to, what, what's going to happen here? If, 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 if the Christians are raised and the Jews are not. Does that make sense? I mean, raised as far as uh, the uh, glorified bodies. We're going to have glorified bodies. We're going to be standing next to the Jews. The Jews, the Bible says, uh, in Revelation chapter 20, again, 4 through 9, uh, they, they're going to be standing there, and uh, Christ is coming back to the Mount of Olives. It's going to split uh, the north and the south, and they're going to have a valley there, and uh, there's going to be a, a, a river flowing underneath the temple and uh, uh, also going out to the Mediterranean Sea. And the Jews in their flesh are going to go into Jerusalem and they're going to have the capital of the world and the 1,000 year millennium is going to take place. Where are the Christians? What do we uh, have to do with the temple? You know, I mean, are we, they're going to reintroduce sacrifices during the millennium. And uh, we could talk about that uh, another time. But in Ezekiel 44 through 48, read it. Ezekiel 44 through 48 says that uh, they're going to reinstitute the sacrifices. The Jews, they're going to set up the uh, Levitical system or uh, the, the priesthood. And then they're going to sacrifice uh, the uh, uh, different, uh, as they did in the Old Testament, different uh, animals. Okay. Think about yourself as a Christian. Uh, are we going to go with the Jews and sacrifice animals? When you go to church and you have fellowship and you're growing in the Lord and you're called a Christian and uh, you're in the pews and some of you, you're down on your knees and others in our hearts were down on our knees. As we come and we worship him, we have a passion for Christ. We want to go out and evangelize. And we want to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And once the last Christian has been saved, the Bible says God is uh, building his temple and it's made up of Christians. That's the end of the church age. It's the end. And that's why we don't see anyone in here to here in the tribulation period, even though here... Chapters 1, 2, and 3, the church ecclesia is mentioned 19 times. And, and, and go to chapters 2 and chapters 3 and functioning. And God is saying, I wish you were this way, and you're going to receive a judgment if you don't repent. And those who are living for me are going to be rewarded. I'll give you another one. The Bible talks about the judgment seat of Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Who is, who is the we? The church. It gives five crowns that the church is working for. When are we working for that? Before the rapture. The Bible doesn't say that we're going to be raptured and come back down and maybe during the millennium we're going to receive these rewards. It doesn't say that. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 speaks about the judgment seat of Christ. And that's not for anyone but for the Christians. You don't read that in the Old Testament. The, you, you, you don't read the crowns. They will receive uh, uh, places of authority during the millennium on earth. Uh, but for Christians, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, it says that our lives, our lives, our works, our yieldedness will be tested, yet as by fire. And that we would, uh, well, let me start, gold, silver, and precious stones, or wood, hay, and stubble. And fire will test our works as to 
the the genuineness of it and the wood hand and uh, uh, the wood hand stubble will be burned up but the uh, the gold the silver and the precious stones will be tested and what will be left will be a more pure vir virgin of it so that's the church and that's what's going to be happening in heaven and then over here as before the, the tribulation ends and uh, Christ comes back, he's coming back with his saints. And where does it say that? It says that in Revelation chapter 19 and verse 12 and verse 14 particularly, and it says those that have the white robes, the righteous robes. And then in verses 7 through 9 of the same chapter, it says that we receive those, that the bride receives those. Righteous robes. Who is the bride? It's the church. Paul says, I have espoused you unto Christ as a chaste bride, a holy bride. And so this is for the church. Do you see the plan? Now, I mean, we, we can't go through all kinds of things because of the time. Uh, to be able to develop this a little bit more, but I want to wrap things up as what we've said. If the church is a different entity from Israel, and I want you to remember this, is that Paul does say that the church is spiritual Israel, but not physical Israel, not national Israel. Abraham uh, was promised in the Abrahamic covenant that uh, the uh, promises for this millennial reign and it hasn't happened who was promised that Abraham was promised that who's Abraham Abraham is the patriarch of who the Jews they're going to have all you got to do is uh, uh, read the last chapters of Ezekiel of Isaiah of uh, Jeremiah uh, you're going to see that God's plan for Israel is going to take place right here, and it's going to go a thousand years. It's a thousand years is the millennium. It's mentioned uh, uh, six times here in Revelation chapter 11. They will start temple. They will build uh, the new temple and have sacrifices, and the Jews go into the millennium with their flesh. Does that mean anything to you? You try to reason these things together. Well, I've got a couple more minutes, and uh, you're going to say, Pastor, it just doesn't seem a whole lot of sense. You are bringing up some things that just don't, what, fit. Is it possible that Christ has a different plan for the church? Is it possible that uh, it says he will keep us, the Philadelphian church? I mean the true church. I'm not talking about the Laodicean church. Is it possible that he will keep the church from his wrath. We're not talking about tribulation because we live in tribulation today. The world in the last hundred years uh, has suffered uh, more deaths for Christ than all the other uh, generations together. And before Jesus Christ comes back, uh, we're going to experience the birth pangs of the tribulation. There's going to be suffering and persecution that we will have to go, to, go through. And we're seeing that uh, that's not far from now, aren't we? with this global pandemic and what's happening as far as the one world government trying to take over the world. And so we are going to face tribulation. And the church is facing tribulation, except that those here in America are not at present. But it's yet to come, and that's the promise before Christ comes back. We're not going through the tribulation because it's the time of God's pouring out his wrath. Now, when does the seven? Uh, seals begin of God's judgment. It begins here. Why? How do you know that? Revelation chapter 6 says that the uh, Antichrist, he calls him uh, uh, the man of peace, and uh, he comes in riding on a white horse to bring a false peace. It starts here. The rapture has to happen here, and the wrath of God begins here. Yeah, the seven bowls of... Uh, God's wrath begins at the middle of the tribulation, but the first part is going to be the last part. I mean, it's going to be the uh, time of God's uh, beginning his wrath through the seven seals, seven sealed scrolls. 
I have to say this. Uh, Christ rose from the dead. That's the first resurrection. He took his body. Glorified body. Then, the second order of resurrection were those Old Testament saints that were in the graves after the resurrection of Christ. They rose bodily out of their graves. The Bible, it's a mystery. The Bible didn't say anything like that was going to happen. That was a mystery. You know, this rapture of the church was a mystery in the Old Testament. The, the church was a mystery in the Old Testament. This rapture is only the beginning of the revealed mystery of God. When Christ comes back, that's the end of the revealed mystery of God. We'll see that. Okay, so there's two resurrections. Christ's bodily resurrection and this Old Testament saints, certain, just a few, that raised out of their graves bodily. What's number three? Before the tribulation, the church. What's number four? The middle of the tribulation. There's going to be... there's. There's going to be a rapture in the middle of the tribulation. Maybe that's the, the mid-trib viewpoint. No. The two prophets here. I've got the two prophets right here who come in, and they become the ones that are going to be the first witnesses that are going to win the 144,000, that are going to win the uh, millions of tribulation saints. Doesn't call them Christians. The church is complete. Why doesn't it call them Christians? It's because they've... Uh, uh, they're not there. It's, it's, it's uh, this Daniel's, Daniel's 70th week. It's not the church. Okay, middle of the tribulation is going to be a bodily resurrection. The saints, uh, the, uh, the two uh, witnesses. Number five, <clears throat> after Daniel's 70th week or after Jacob's trouble, the Old Testament saints will be resurrected to enter into the millennial kingdom, the Old Testament saints right here. Somebody can say what, what passage is, and I'll give them to you quickly. Uh, Daniel 12, 1 through 2, Daniel 12, 1 through 2, Isaiah 26, 19, Ezekiel 37, 13 through 14, Old Testament saints being raised for the millennium. Millennium is not for you and I to uh, sit with Abraham and uh, Moses and and then to sit with uh, Aaron and to go through this, uh, the, uh, the temple sacrifices, we will be there. We'll be, we'll be in heaven, but we'll have access, just like the angels that come back and forth. Uh, what next? Uh, what's number six? Another resurrection? Yes. Uh, it's going to be the tribulation martyrs. The Bible says, Revelation 12, 4 through 6. Those that die and are beheaded... That, that are raised, they are raised. Where are they raised? They are raised here when Christ comes back. The tribulation saints are raised from the dead. That's six resurrections. There's another. The seventh resurrection is the unbelieving dead, and that's Revelation 20, 11 through 15. And their dead bodies will be raised, and they will sit through the great tribulation period. Uh, the tribulation saints raised from the dead, but here, at the end of the millennium, at the great white throne judgment, the tribulation, not, yeah, um, <clears throat> those, those who uh, were, uh, those who um, died in all of the ages uh, prior to the great tribulation period, and then all those that died during the tribulation period as well that were unbelievers. So all the unbelieving dead will be raised, Revelation 20, 11 through 15, right here. And then they go to the great white throne judgment. All right, let me close this in a word of prayer. Father, thank you for the opportunity that we've had to spend some time in your word. I pray that uh, we've gained some insight. I pray that, uh, I know this is not the end of it. I know that there are still questions. We all have questions. I'm ever seeking, Lord, for your will and your direction. But I think, Father, that uh, when we look at uh, the uniqueness of the church and the fact that it's there in the first uh, three chapters, but it's mysteriously absent from chapters 4 through 19, and that we're seeing in heaven in 19, 6 through 7, not a partial church, a full church, 
Otherwise, we couldn't have the marriage of the Lamb. We couldn't have the marriage of the Lamb because the whole church wouldn't be there. Father, uh, we thank you for this insight and we just pray that you would help us to grow in our the grace and the knowledge and the understanding of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who was the first fruits, the firstborn of the dead, and uh, for those whom he died and for those who make up his body. Of course, Christ died for all, but for those that make up his body. And so, Father, we thank you and praise you. I should bless you on uh, the remainder of this uh, evening. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I want to say this quickly, that uh, you want to uh, be here Sunday because we're having a, we're meeting in our church. And it's starting at 11 a.m. with social distancing. If you have some masks, bring your mask. We do have uh, hand sanitizer. We will uh, social distance. And uh, we understand if you can't make it, uh, some of the older folk are, uh, may be concerned. Uh, I'll be there. But it's going to be Ed Valentin, missionary, and he's going to be preaching. And Tom Fonts is going to be there. And he'll be sharing a little bit about missions. So, uh, we just like to invite you for this coming Lord's Day. God bless you.